Welcome to The Unconventional Path, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Stories and Ideas. Hello, I'm Balaam Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Today's guest on the podcast is Michelle Saylor Tucker. She is a 20-year veteran of the mergers and acquisition industry, where she is a leading authority on buying, selling, financing, and growing businesses. We had a great conversation about how founders and company leaders often do not think about positioning their company for a successful acquisition. And Bela, I know you and I have both had a few experiences with buying and selling businesses. You a little more than me. Um, but you know, the, the first time that I sold a business, it was really scary, right? And for a lot of things you said, valuing, what's the valuation of the business, getting uh, an appraisal, figuring out what the right price is, um, going through all the terms, right, which are really complicated, um, and and it's very emotional, right? Um, I've also been involved, and you again more so than me, with, with buying a business. And there's a lot of risk there, and um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you put a lot of capital into making an acquisition. So I think this is a real important issue um, that anybody who's entrepreneurial needs to think about at some point. You and I have talked a lot about, you know, what's the exit strategy, right? And this is a lot of times what the exit strategy is. So I'm looking forward to listening to your conversation with Michelle. Let's get right to it. Sounds good, Mike. Welcome to the Unconventional Path. I'm Bale Musitz, your host for today's episode. Today, my guest is Michelle Seiler Tucker. She is a 20-year veteran of the mergers and acquisitions industry, where she is a leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing businesses. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, sure. So let me ask you a question to start off here. Is there a particular sweet spot that that you tend to focus on from a either a sector or a size of business, et cetera? Yeah, our sweet spot are the businesses that make money. Okay, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. So- so we specialize typically in businesses, um, purchase price $10 million and up, usually an EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, appreciation, amortization of a million dollars and up. Okay. Okay. So main as far as industry, we're industry agnostic. I've been in this industry for over 20 years. We sold hundreds and hundreds of businesses in pretty much every industry you can imagine. So we are industry agnostic. We do have lots and lots of buyers for SaaS companies, SaaS e-commerce, IT, staffing, medical, uh, manufacturing, you know, that's that's where most of the buyers are. But um, when you get the business to over a million dollars in EBITDA, that's when you have a lot more buyers. That's when that's business. when you get people's attention. Yes. Anything under a million dollars in EBITDA doesn't get <laughs> doesn't really get attention. Yeah. That's why we have a road to exit rich program. Well, we help our business owners bridge that gap of evaluation and really get their business over that million dollar hump. Yeah. Now, uh, do you tend to work more with buyers or with sellers? We work, well, we work with both, obviously. You can't sell a business without a buyer. But <laughs> as far as who we engage with, we mostly engage with sellers. Yes. Okay. Yep. That's exactly what I meant. So uh, from, a, from a seller's perspective, are, are there three or five sort of common misconceptions they have about selling their business? Yeah, the biggest misconception is somebody's going to pay $20 million for it when it's worth a million. <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest misconception is always the price because sellers base the price of their business on what they need to enter the next phase of their life, whether that's retirement, you know, buying another business, relocating. And they really don't look at the value of the business because they know nothing about how to evaluate a business. And that's the biggest misconception. Another big one other than the price, the valuation gap is they think, you know, one buyer has approached them and I think they're going to work with that one buyer and that one buyer is going to buy their business. And the likelihood of the one buyer buying your business is slim to none. And not only that, but, but business owners should never work with that one buyer because it's usually a customer, you know, it's usually a vendor. It's somebody that you're already doing business with. And if you really don't cross your T's and dot your I's, then you can ruin that relationship and lose your big customer or lose a mm. vendor, you know, and, and plus you'll never be able to maximize value and you'll never really be able, um, you know, to get the highest price. If you have one buyer, you know, we like to create a bidding war. We have over 45,000 buyers in our database 
And it's very easy for us to bring 100 or 200, 300 buyers to one transaction. It's very easy for us to bring 5, 10, 15, 20 LOIs in one transaction. That's when you get the most value and the highest price is when you're working with multiple buyers. You never want to have just one buyer because if that one buyer falls apart, you have no backup buyers. Yeah. So that's a big misconception. Um, the other big misconception is, oh, they're going to buy 100% of my company. <laughs> So in larger transactions where the EBITDA is, you know, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, 7 million and up, most buyers are not wanting to buy 100%. They're wanting the sweet spot is 70 to 80% because they want that owner to still be involved. You know, they feel that owner is still um, crucial to the business and, and the business still depends on that owner, whether they do or not. You know, buyers feel like they don't necessarily have the management team or the manager in mind to go run that company. Right. So that's a, another big misconception. Right, right. Now, what about on the other side? What, uh, on those occasions when you do work with buyers, sort of yeah. what are their misconceptions? What are, what are the things that they sort of miss the mark on? Um, you know, there's, it depends upon the buyer. There's five different types of buyers. And so there's, there's first-time buyers, 90% of the buyers are first-time buyers who are buying the small restaurants, the coffee shops, the ice cream stores, things of that nature. You have turnaround specialists that are buying distressed assets. You got private equity groups that buy based on platforms and add-ons. And then you got cons- competitors and strategics who are typically the best buyer because they're buying those proprietary synergies, those assets that will catapult their current business to the next level. And right. then the last time, it's a, it's a Sophisticated, sophisticated entrepreneur. So, what are buyers' misconceptions? It really depends upon the buying type. You know, if if it's um, if it's uh, the first time buyer, a lot of times their misconception is they think training is working. So when you say, "Oh, the owner is going to train for two months," they think the owner is actually going to work in the business for those two months. So that's a huge misconception. Um, a lot of times turnaround specialists, their misconception is, oh, this business is so terrible. I'm just going to use the, the assets of the business to leverage the assets and buy the company and give the owner nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, as far as private equity groups, I think a lot of their misconceptions is they feel that the business owner has to stay in the business when that's not always accurate. We have an electrical company we're selling right now. And we've had about 300 buyers. We've had several LOIs, but it's all for a percentage of the company. And my seller wants to sell 100%. He works 10 hours a week. He's got, you know, 73 employees. He's got a pretty good management team in place, over $7 million in EBITDA. And they want to buy 70%, 80% and keep him on for three to four years, three to five years. That's a misconception. The other one is they just think that the the seller is naive and going to roll over equity into their current company. And, you know, we just we just had a call uh, with a company that gave us an offer on, on a business that we have. And the offer was terrible offer because they wanted to come to the table with no money down. They wanted to do an earn out based on 15 percent of gross revenue and do a, a million-dollar rollover into their current company. Their current company is a shell. <laughs> it doesn't own anything. <laughs> yeah, so that's a misconception. Um, another big misconception is buyers will think the contracts are transferable and they're not. You know, so we really have to work with the seller and buyer to, to, to get that, you know, get those contracts transferable. Yeah, yeah. So, Very yeah. good. Uh so let, let's walk through a scenario here. So let's say I own a, a business. I have about $20 million in annual sales. I got, you know, three or $4 million in EBITDA. And I, what I want to do is I want to buy another business, right? I, I'd like to expand my geographic footprint. So I want to buy a similar business to mine, similar industry, but sort of mm-hmm. in a different part of the country because I want to expand there. So what would, I, if I called you up on the phone, sort of, Take me through what the process would be to sort of sort through this. Yeah, of course. So first and foremost, we would do a needs assessment. You know, what are you really needing? What are you really wanting? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your objectives? What are you looking for? What is your buying criteria? You know, from 
Are you wanting a business that operates on all six P's? We talk about the six P's and synergies in my book, which are people, product, processes, proprietary patrons and profits. So are you wanting a business to operate on all six P's? What are you really looking for other than footprint? And then what are you looking for from a financial standpoint? You know, are you looking, are, are you looking for just uh, a good strategic fit, you know, or like private equity groups are looking for a platform in a whole new industry. But if right. you're looking for just a strategic fit, we want to know what is your culture? What's your culture? What's your management team? You know, are, are there going to be, are, are any of your employees from your current location going to help manage that operation, you know? Like I said, what what are you, what's your buying criteria? What do the numbers have to look like? We're going to take you through a full assessment to make that fit of who who we think could be a good fit for you because it's going to fit from not just this the synergistic you know approach where you're buying these synergies, these congruent uh, revenue streams, but also from a culture fit and from a financial fit. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh- so how do we? How would you guide me through the process of uh, evaluating the value of a potential acquisition? Yeah. So <laughs> number one, if we were working with you and representing you as a buyer, we would target. We would, you know, target the buyers that we feel like are a good, the sellers that are a good fit, and it would be in our best interest to do the valuation on that business rather than accept somebody else's evaluation. Yes. So we would want to get them into our system, evaluate their business on not just the financials, but evaluate their business on the six P's, look at those proprietary assets, look at, you know, what are their strengths, what are opportunities, you know, take them through the SWOT analysis, take them through the six P analysis, and really come up with what we feel the value is on that business looking at their financials. Now, sometimes sellers will agree to that. <laughs> sometimes they won't, you know, it depends on if they're really wanting to sell. And then if, if they don't agree to that and they already have a valuation done, which most sellers don't, most sellers don't get their business evaluated unless they're really, really looking at selling it. Right, right. And if I'm buying a business, uh, does the, does the uh, legal, the form of legal entity important to me? In other words, do I want an LLC, an S corp, a C corp? So usually when most buyers buy a business, they want to, they want to buy it as an asset sale, not a stock sale. So they want to buy it as an asset sale, buying the assets of the company. They want a DBA so they can continue to use the company's name. They can set up their own corporation rather than a uh, sub S or, or a sub C a series LLC or right. whatever, you know, is, is good for them. So they can set up their own, their own corporation doing business apps. And, and why do, why do buyers want to buy assets as opposed to, you know, the, the well, shares? One, depreciation. I'm and sorry, one, say that again. One is depreciation. Okay. They want to depreciate those assets. Number two is they don't want to be liable for anything that happened on the seller's watch, rather that be workers' comp issues uh, rather that be, you know, any type of pending lawsuits, tax issues, et cetera, because we can add indemnification clauses and hold harmless all day long, but it doesn't really matter when the IRS gets involved. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or some major lawsuits. Right. Okay. Very good. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about now. Let's flip flip it over. Let's say, again, I still have the same business, but now I want to sell. So I call yeah. you up and say, hey, Michelle, you know, um, I'm 65. I want to stop working in a year or two. So sort of help me understand what the process is for me to sell my business and let's find a buyer together. Yeah. So first and first, first and foremost, we do conduct about an hour um, call, really an interview with you and, you know, really try to take you through the seller's sanity check to make sure you are a motivated seller. <laughs> You know, see how realistic you are on price, because like I said, one of the number, the biggest issues is sellers have an unrealistic idea of what they think their business is worth because they base the value of their business on what they feel like they need to retire on versus the true value of their company. Yeah. So we take you through a seller sanity check, see how motivated you are, 
kind of rate what's most important to you. You know, obviously what we sell a company for is, is usually the most, one of the most important things to sell it, but sellers, but it's not about what we sell your business for. It's about what you walk away with. Mm -hmm. So we're really taking it through that seller sanity check to see, you know, you're 65. What do you need? How much money do you feel like you need a month? How much money do you feel like you need a year? We have DST for sales trust programs that we work with to help sellers defer capital gains. Then we want to take you through uh, an assessment about, you know, what's most important to you. Is it, is it just selling to any buyer and getting the highest price? Is it selling? Is it maybe even taking a lower price, selling to the right buyer because taking care of your customers, taking care of your employees, you know, growing your legacy are the most important things. So we really walk you through a seller sanity check, and then um, if we feel like it's a good fit and you're a motivated seller, then we would start the evaluation process. We explain, you know, obviously how we work, take you through the evaluation process, which includes the six P assessment. The six P assessment is a one to two hour call. And really walking the seller through those six P's. You know, do you have the right employees in place? Do you have the right people in the right seats? How many tasks are you doing in your company? Are you working on it? Or are you working in it? How long can you take off <laughs> and your company, you know, not miss a beat? Are you in a thriving industry? Are you in a dying industry? Do you have management team in place? Do you have non compete contracts? Do you have employment contracts? And we take you through the processes. Do you have the processes, the SOPs, everything? You know, in order for each department, do you have those contracts in place? And then we take you through proprietary. What are your proprietary assets? How well branded are you? How, you know, how much name recognition do you have? Do you have a federal trademark? Is your is your company name at risk because somebody else owns that trademark and you haven't checked the federal database? Right. Do you have patents in place because that is this value? Do you have a database? Can that database be retargeted? You know, it's kind of like Facebook. Facebook was hemorrhaging money, but they had a billion users. And, and Facebook, I'm sorry, WhatsApp was hemorrhaging money. They had a billion users, and Facebook paid $19 billion for the company. So we want to go through that. We want to look at your contracts. Are your contracts truly transferable? Because every owner tells me yes, and every owner I've ever worked with is wrong. Right. <laughs> so we want to look at those contracts and make sure they're transferable. Now we want to go through your content. I want to go through all your proprietary assets because one thing that we do when we're evaluating businesses is we look at those synergies, those assets that other buyers are going to pay a premium for. Buyers will pay a premium for, con for customer contracts. They'll pay a premium for patents. They'll pay a premium, you know, for a recurring subscription. They'll pay a premium for celebrity endorsements. Also, we look to see what can we cut in your business. Like we have a manufacturing business we're selling that has a $5 million distribution center. Guess what? The buyer has manufacturing distribution centers all over the country. Right. The first thing they're going to cut is that five million dollar distribution center. So we look at things like that. What can we cut? What can we cut to increase revenues and in EBITDA? Increase EBITDA the day one of closing. And then we look at the pay trends, customer base. You follow the 80-20 rule where 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your clients and you're about to go out of business because you have customer concentration or do you have customer diversification? Have you been in business 30 years your customers are aging out and you haven't innovated and haven't marketed in which to, which, in which to attract a newer generation of buyers? And then we look at your profits. What's your profit margin? How profitable are you compared to your competitors? So we take you through that whole process. We also prepare five-year projections. We get the business wonderfully qualified. And then once we enter into an engagement agreement, we go to market. We put together your prospectus and we go to market. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so give me a ballpark on if I'm thinking of selling my business, uh, do I call you up a year in advance, uh, six months in advance? Sort of what's yeah, the timing of these question. things? That's a very good question. And I always like to say, because here's the thing. I would love sellers to start planning their exit from day one of starting or buying their company. Like Stephen Covey always says, start with the end in mind. And in my book, Exit Rich, I have a whole chapter dedicated to the GPS exit model. When should you start? Day one. <laughs> but most business owners never, ever do that. So when you start thinking about selling your business, I, would like, I want you to call me then. And the reason I want you to call me then is we really got to measure where are you in the process? How, how wide is that valuation gap? Are you operating in all six Ps? Are your financials in order? You know, there's so many different things that we have to look at 
And there are some businesses that call me, like like this electrical company we're selling. I didn't hardly have to do anything. They were offering all six Bs. He works 10 to 15 hours a week. He's got a great management team in place. We had to do very, very little to get him to market. We got an app company. App company's been on the market two weeks, already got um, $1.5 million above the appraised price. So some companies are ready to go to market right away. Well, you got others that are not nowhere close. And like Steve Forbes, who endorsed Exit Rich, he says 80% of the businesses on the market will never sell. That's because business owners go to a broker, they go to an advisor, the advisor doesn't do any work on their business, they don't take them through these processes, they stick the business up on the market, and the business is overpriced in most cases, and the business has you know, a lot of skeletons in the, in, in the closet. We want to remove the skeleton. We want to identify the skeletons. We want to remove the skeletons. Yeah. We want to get the business to operate at all six fees. And we want to make sure that we clean our financial house. And that's why we, we have the Road to Exit Rich program because we have a client right now that we just took in. They want to sell for $5 million. Right now, they're worth a million. And they're in our program for a year. At the end of the year, they'll be at the $5 million price tag. So it just really depends on where your business is versus what you want to sell your company for. Yeah, yeah. So you've mentioned your book a couple times. So let's talk a little bit about your book. So tell me the title and, and sort of its target audience and, and some of the content. So the title is Exit Rich because it sure beats exiting poor. <laughs> and the reason I wrote Exit Rich is because I've been in this industry for 20 plus years. It's my third book. Endorsed, like I said, by Steve Forbes, my co-author, Sharon Lecter, who wrote Rich Jeff, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki, Kevin Harrington, original Shark on Shark Tank, Worth the Forward. Exit Rich is not just about selling your business. Exit Rich is for all entrepreneurs, anyone looking at buying, starting a company, business owners, even high-level management teams. Because Exit Rich, the first half of it, is all about building a business that is sustainable, that you can scale, and when you're ready, you have a sellable asset. Because right now, I'll guarantee you 80% of the businesses that come to the market will never sell. So it's all about building your business on the infrastructure, planning your GPS exit model, and actually building a business that buyers want to buy. Yeah. And that's the big misconception. Sellers, the biggest misconception is sellers always think their baby is prettier than everybody else's. Because <laughs> they think of their business as their baby, not as a valuable asset right. that it is. Yep. So that's a huge misconception. So we, I really work on sellers' mindset to get them to separate their business, you know, get them to separate from the emotional side of their business. Yeah. Your babies are go home, love them, hug them, kiss them. <laughs> but your business is your most valuable asset. Yeah. And so Exit Rich is all about building that sustainable, scalable business. The first half. The second half is about selling it. How to package it, valuations, you know, even the five different types of buyers and what their negotiation methods are, their negotiables and their non negotiables. Yeah, great. Sounds like a wonderful book. So, Exit Rich, and uh, where's the best it's place? It's a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. Oh, yeah, <laughs> wow. So, where's the best place for me to get it? Well, so I don't want to get too many choices, but you can go to a Hudson Bookstore or it's at 99 Hudson Bookstores and all the airports, Barnes yeah. and Noble. You know, books a million. You can go to Amazon and get it. You can also go to exitrichbook.com. We're happy, so excited that the audio version just came out as well. And you can buy the audio version on Amazon, book, you know, Barnes and Noble, Apple, wherever you like to listen to your audio books. And Exit Rich, when you buy Exit Rich, you're not just getting a book, Exit Rich, which is worth, has million and million dollars of ideas in it. But you're also becoming a lifetime member of the Exit Rich Book Club. And in the Exit Rich Book Club, you get access to all the video training and content that I've been teaching and training on for you know in the trenches for the last 20 years, plus documents. So we have documents to operate your business and documents to sell your business. Oh, great. Example of policy and procedure manuals, example employee handbooks. To sell, we have example of letter of intents, due diligence checklists, purchase agreements, closing documents. And all of those documents are there to operate and sell your company. And these documents have been created by attorneys. You know how much attorneys cost. Yeah. <laughs> so I probably spent over $50,000 creating all of these documents. Oh, that sounds wonderful. So uh, let's wrap this up here. Um, is there something I should have asked you that I haven't? Is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Um, is there something you should have asked me that you haven't? 
I would say um, I, one of the biggest things is sellers wait too wait, sellers wait too long. They don't think about selling their business to a catastrophic event occurs. You know, yeah. whether that's internal, external, internal is health issues, partners issues, divorce, death, external is this pandemic. You have to start planning your exit now. Don't wait too long. Connect with the M and A advisor so they can get your business sell ready because you really don't want to end up in that eighty percent statistic. Yeah, excellent. So, what's the best way for people to find you and uh, contact you? Sure, they can go to SolidTucker.com. That's SolidTucker.com. They can also go to SolidTuckerAcademy.com and take the six B quiz to see what are your strongest and weakest Bs. All right, wonderful. Hey, well, thank you very much for being a guest on the show. I really appreciate thank it. Yeah. I would encourage everybody to listen to Exit Rich Podcast, too. Uh, I will do that. I'll put all this information in the show notes, including the book and uh, the Exit Rich Podcast. And uh, hopefully it'll help uh, some of our listeners. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. You betcha. Bye-bye. Bye. Bela, well, that was a really interesting interview and a conversation, I think, where at least gave me a lot to think about. Um Put on your VC hat for a minute, right? And when you were back doing a lot of venture capital work, what are the lessons that you tried to coach entrepreneurs with as they are thinking about this exit strategy, um, you know, via selling the business? And how does what Michelle talked about align with your experiences? Yeah, it's a great point, Mike. Uh, You know, one of the things that we always try to talk about is, you know, companies have product strategies, they have a strategy they'll talk about, about developing their products, how they're going to introduce a family of products or a platform. Um, and, and they have strategies for acquiring customers. They'll talk about, you know, here's our go-to-market strategy. Here's, here's uh, how we're going to brand the company. Here's what a cost of acquisition per customer is. Uh, so they understand all those things and they focus on them. But hardly anyone ever focuses on sort of building a strategy for selling your business. And, you know, as VCs, we, we tend to focus on that because that was how we made our profits and our, and our business. That we had to sell businesses successfully in order for the VC firm to stay in business. So we often t- talked about that and tried to get companies and entrepreneurs to focus on that. Uh, and it takes preparation. It takes planning. Uh, you got to sort of think about, okay, what do we need to do to be attractive to a potential buyer? What are buyers looking for? And you can look at any industry and you can, you can look at the mergers and acquisitions that took place in that industry in the last 10 years. And you'll probably see some patterns. You'll see that companies acquired other companies when they got to be a particular size or a size meaning, let's say, revenue, or number of customers. Different industries and different acquirers will have different metrics that they look for. Some will look for top-line revenue. Some will look for number of customers. Some will look for geographic market strength. Uh, So you have to kind of figure out what, what the key things are in that industry and then drive and build your business so that that stuff is outstanding or I should say stands out, so that that's when you become attractive to a potential buyer. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it's really an interesting question. And I know that, you know, Michelle wants you to buy the book and be listen to her podcast and all these things. But yeah, I can't reinforce what you just said enough, Bela, that this really needs to be a thoughtful, planful thing. And it's just not on the radar screen when you're trying to build a scalable business. Right, it's the last thing that's on your mind. So that's I right. think this podcast is a great reminder for all of you who are starting a business or thinking about starting a business that this is just such a, a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, even if you never sell the business, even if you hold on to it and pass it on to your children, having this strategy is a key part, I think, of your um, of your planning that you need to do to be a successful entrepreneur. Um, let's look at it from the other side, Bela. From you've bought a business or two, right? Um, Let's talk about what you experience, what you learned from your experiences. Yeah, so uh, I think there's a couple of points here 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 to make. Uh, for, at least for me, and I think this is true for many people who are thinking about buying a business. History is important, and what I mean by that is if you have four or five years of steady 
growth. And again, it depends on what the buyer's looking for. If they're looking for top line revenue, are they looking for EBITDA growth? Are they looking for customer number of customers growth or revenue per customer? Uh, you know, what are the metrics they're looking for? But nothing is is more comforting to a potential buyer than to see several years worth of steady growth in the metrics that they're very interested in. So having that history is important. For me, as a potential buyer or as as a VC, what always was sort of a little bit of a warning sign is something that's spiky, meaning it, you know, y- you have this great growth rate. And for, for two or three months, and then all of a sudden it sort of stops or it flattens off, you know, like, so what's going on there, right? What's, what's causing both the spike and what's causing the downturn or the flattening. So inconsistency in performance is oftentimes a bad thing for a buyer. Consistency and history is important. Right. Are they uh, stuff yep. in the are they stuff in the distribution channels? Right. Are right. there operational problems and bottlenecks that they're not admitting? Right. These are all things that you and I have both seen many times. Right. And and every everyone who's in business knows that you can fudge the numbers, fudge the numbers, not in an illegal way. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but you can do certain things that that'll make any number you want look much better for a short period of time. <laughs> Right? You can cut expenses to make your bottom line look better. You can stuff the chain, the supply chain to make, you know, your shipments look better. You, there's things that you can do. Um, so that's why history is important and, and steadiness, uh, consistent growth is important. The, the other thing to remember is transactions take a long time. Th- this, is, this is not like going into a car dealer, you know, negotiating a deal in a half hour and the next day walking out with a car. That's not how it works, right? These transactions take long periods of time. So there's this upfront negotiating. There's this term sheet that you sort of agree to, which is a one or two page document that outlines, you know, sort of what it's going to be. And, and then you dive into it. And there's a thousand things that can go wrong during this process where the buyer will say, nope, that's it. I'm out. And uh, the buyer is usually the one in charge here, unless there's a bidding war going on. And then, of course, it's a, it's a seller's market. But in most of these transactions, it's, a, it's the buyer has the strength. And, and so the due diligence takes a long time. And they will want to crawl through everything. So, again, this is, talks back to the first point we made when we started this conversation is about being prepared. So having your financial records all in order, having audited financials, having your intellectual property agreements all in order, right? Having all of the contracts that you have, your, your sellers, or excuse me, your buyers, your customers, uh, I should say, your customers in the database and your customer management relationship system, all of those things are really important. And the, and the more of, of those things are nice and shiny and they work really well, the faster the transaction will happen and the more comfort the buyer will get as they move through the process, right? We often talk about, is this, is this, is this transaction gaining momentum or is it losing momentum, right? And that's a sense that you can get, right? There's sometimes when you, when you go into buying a business, you know, you start uncovering stuff and, and I characterize it as it's losing momentum, right? It's getting closer and closer to blowing up and not happening. And others... It's just everything you look at is like, oh, this is really great. They're doing a really good job at this. This is fantastic. And it's gaining momentum, right? And, it's, and, and so that's sort of a, something you need to think about. Cool. You know, this is another thing that I've experienced a couple different times is um, Michelle talked about the gap between what the seller thinks the business is worth and what the buyer thinks it's worth. And, you know, you talked a little bit of the disconnect between value and price, right? How do you cut through that gap? How do you how do you bridge that gap? Whether it's um, getting a more realistic view of the of the, what the price should be, or um, communicating what the value is to the seller, so that the buyer is willing to pay more. Well, I think as a seller, <clears throat> you want to understand or try to understand what what are the key things that the buyer is looking for. Remember, we did a podcast a while ago with Devin Watson, who who works for. Uh, uh, Diebold Nextdorf, 
and uh, he was in the mergers and acquisition business there. That's one of the things he did. And he talked about strategic fit, that when, when uh, Diebold went to buy somebody, that acquire someone, they would, they would think about it strategically. How does this new company we're thinking about buying fit inside of our bigger business? And how can we leverage what that company has uh, with the assets that we have to make it grow, grow really quickly? So you got to think about what are the important things to the person who's potentially buying you and, and focus on those. And those are the things that, number one, you want to build up and strengthen and sort of highlight in your conversations and discussions and make sure that they understand the value of it and how long it's taken you and the depth of relationships with your customers, let's say, if that's an important thing, right? And how loyal your customers are. What's your customer turnover rate? Uh, you know, various different things, whatever, whatever the key metrics they're looking at. Uh, I think you want to, you want to, as a seller, you want to make sure you understand that. And I think as a seller, you also have to come to uh, some recognition. What are you trying to get out of this transaction, right? What are the things that are important to you? You know, what do you want to walk away from? Is it cash? Is it stock in the acquiring company? Is, are you looking for a long-term employment agreement? You know, be honest with yourself and communicate those things to the buyer, and say, look, here's, here's the three things that are really important to me in this transaction. I don't want you to lay off any of my employees, <laughs> right? My, the employees are really important. I don't want you to shut the plant down uh, or, the, or the facility down. And I want to get at least X number of dollars of cash out of this deal, Wh whatever they are. Just be upfront about them. Don't be mystical about them. And, and because if your expectation is, if, is a, you, as I used to say in the VC business, if you think something, as you as a buyer, think something is worth $10, and I as a seller think it's worth $50, we are not going to have a deal. Let, let's just get that up front and walk away from it. But if you think it's worth $10, and I think it's worth $14, we'll figure out somehow to make this work. <laughs> right? So what you're trying to do is make sure you're in the ballpark. And then once you're in the ballpark... You can play with all sorts of variables like terms of the deal, right? The timing of the payments, right? Performance measures in there that trigger different payments to sort of bring two parties together. So there's lots of variables you can play with. But first of all, you have to make sure you're both in the ballpark or at least you're relatively close to each other on what your expectations are. So be upfront about them. Yeah, agreed. And you got to do your homework. And Michelle talked about this too, as a seller, you got to know what the comparable sales are. You got to know what the multiples are. You got to know the the book value of your assets versus the market value of your assets are. You got to know these things and and work realistically. But I love your point, Bela, is not everything is about the dollar value that you're selling for. There's a whole bunch of other variables that you can play with to get to where, to what you really want to know. Right, to what you really need to sell, what you really need to feel comfortable and sleep well at night. And that's why right. I usually recommend, and again, I'm not the world's greatest expert on negotiations, but if you know what you need and you can communicate that to the other party, it's much more likely that you'll make a deal. Right, Because maybe some of it's in cash and some of it's in stock, which isn't worth a lot right now, but could be. So there's a risk there. Right. Right? right, Or, right, like you said, maybe there's a, a clawback position or um, a, per a percentage of future profits that you can throw in there um, that in three years or in five years, there's a payment, um, you know, kind of a, a, a bonus payment. If the company does well, then you share in that a little bit. So there's lots of creative ways to do that that are not painful for the, for the buyer, um, but that can make the seller very happy, uh, even if it's not the number, the final number that they want. Right. Oh, and one other one other quick thing I wanted to add to that list yep. was as as a as a seller, you have tax implications on this transaction, big time, right? And it, and those tax and there can be huge differences in those tax implications on how you structure the deal. So that's another sort of negotiating lever you have, yep. right? There, there there may be certain certain things that look at least at at first blush a whole lot more interesting. But, you know, the taxes are going to be a lot higher on it. So there, there may be, there are often things you can do in structuring the transaction uh, that will make it actually much more 
rewarding to the seller if you structure them a certain way because the tax implications get minimized. Real life example, I sold a business. There were two businesses that were part of it. One was owned the, the, the land and the building and one owned the business. And, um, and we realized that the sale was going to trigger everybody into a higher tax bracket. Okay. And, um, and also that in one year, and I forget which way it was capital gains, um, was going to be higher and one year it was going to be lower. So we structured the deal that we didn't sell both parts at the same time. We sold one part in one year, got those proceeds that went on the tax. And then, you know, that was December 1st or December 15th. And then on right. January 15th, right. we sold the other business. Completely legal, completely ethical, right? I think, but um, I know it was legal, right? I'm pretty sure it's ethical. I didn't see a problem with it, but it lowered right. the tax bill big time for um, the people that that were the sellers, okay? Yeah. Um, and yep. so, it, and we traded that off. It didn't, the, 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 the buyer didn't care so much, right? Right. Didn't have tax That's implications right. really for the buyer at all. It only did for the seller. And we were able to negotiate, okay, we're not going to get exactly what we want. It's a lower price. But if we structure the, this, this way, we'll have a lower tax feed. So our actual take home from the deal, right, would actually be the same as if the price was higher. It was yeah. a creative solution on how to bridge a gap. Yeah. yeah. Great example. Great example. Just by waiting 30 days. <laughs> Yep. From from one fiscal year to another year. Yep. And and splitting up something that was already split up anyways, we were able to, yep. to, to buy, but looking creatively at taxes, right? And legally, I might add, it, you know, yes. didn't do anything illegal. Yep. Great. Well, this is interesting. And, you know, again, this was one of a guest that, you know, has a book and has a podcast and has all these things, but definitely had some, I think, really interesting things to say um, about the process and things that I thought were great for me to learn and, and to understand. And I hope that they were useful for the, the listeners as well. What do you think? Should we wrap it up? Yeah, I think so, Mike. Let's uh, give this one a wrap. All right. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us. And we hope you found this interesting and thought provoking as well. As always, if you have suggestions or questions, please get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. And please do follow the podcast if you haven't already by hitting that follow button in your favorite podcasting application. And until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon, Mike. Sounds great, Bailon, for over here in Munster, Germany. See you next time.